So up next, we have Ro Young coming up. Ro Young is both an M MD and also an MBA. He recently graduated from UCSD Radio School of Management back in 2010, and has then he started a, his own company, Always. Tonight, he's going to share with us the innovative idea of evolution, a new era, the disease of abundance. Definitely a different approach to how we view today's society's growing health problems. So here we welcome Royan. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about a concept called evolution. I was a second year medical student at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and uh, we had actually a fellow alum, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, who went on to do an internal medicine residency at Harvard, and uh, he's on faculty at UC San Francisco. And he showed us this slide, and it really resonated with me, it really hit home. Uh, what you can see in the front, there's a couple docks, and um, you can see they're wearing stethoscopes, and they're mopping up the floor, it looks like a bathroom. But meanwhile, the culprit's back here, right? This boss has been left on. So that kind of really sends a, you know, a pretty simple message in a pretty clear way that we're, we're, in medicine we've been fighting a lot of the downstream problems without realizing or addressing the root causes of the disease. So what do I mean by evolution? Well, evolution is pretty simply the evolution of disease. So as organisms adapt to the environment and learn how to overcome whatever diseases have they succumbed to in the past, well, eventually they have to die of something. So the nature of that disease, the nature of their death, changes with time. Hundreds and thousands of years ago, things like starvation and trauma were major causes of death for the mass majority of our species. But as we figured out how to manage our agriculture, we figured out first aid, well, things like infection cropped up, right? But then human innovation took over once again. We developed antibiotics, we developed vaccinations, and now we're at a horizon where things like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are the major killers. So the fact that we're facing these problems is actually a sign of our progression. As we jump into the talk, I want to tell you how a lot of what we're facing now is actually chronic in nature versus the acute type of disease we've been facing in the past. There's a simple metaphor I was taught as a neurobiology student in undergrad, where if you take a frog and you put it in boiling water, it'll jump out, right? It'll sense it's in a dangerous environment, its reflexes will kick in, in less than a second, the frog is out of that boiling pot of water. You take the same frog and you put it in some lukewarm water and you gradually bring it to a boil over time, that frog is just going to sit there until it boils over and dies. So what we're facing as a society today, I would argue, is an era of abundance that we're not, at this time, well equipped enough to address. And that's why we're seeing a lot of disease, uh, the, the epidemics of disease that we're seeing. So one category that's kind of obvious, and I think we're all familiar with, is food, where we really have a lot more food than we need for our given population here in the United States and many developed nations. And this is sort of an economics 101 graph, right? That for a given person, for a given population, a certain amount of food is actually optimal. Obviously, you don't want to be back in the old ages where we didn't have enough to put on the table, but we've actually hit another point where the marginal benefit is being outweighed by the marginal cost of those additional units of food. The harm is actually outweighing the benefits. And that's where we're seeing obesity kick in. Two-thirds of the U.S. is either obese or overweight. Diabetes. One-third of the U.S. is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Metabolic syndrome, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, many types of cancer are associated with overeating, and a whole new set of GI disorders. The New England Journal of Medicine really hit this message home in 2005 with this, with this study, epidemiological study. And the, the scientists behind this were from Harvard and UC San Francisco. And they came out with this quote that because of the diabetes and the obesity epidemics that we're seeing, the youth of today may, on average, live less healthy and possibly even shorter lives than their parents. So this is the ultimate fail from one generation to the next. We've never seen this in modern human history, where the child generation is actually expected to have a shorter lifespan and a poor quality of life than the parent generation. Another category that I argue we have too much of, and it's actually not a good thing, a healthy thing, is cropping up a whole new um, a whole new set of new chronic disease that we're facing, is information. So once again, I would argue for a given person, for a given population, a certain amount of information is a good thing. But what happens when you have too much? Well, if you don't have enough time to process that information that you're receiving from, from stimuli overload, you become distractible, you develop ADHD-like symptoms, you get stressed out, 
And then stress plugs right into anxiety and depression. And we're seeing epidemics of those in today's society as well. And the way we receive our information actually caters to a very sedentary lifestyle that promotes obesity, diabetes, heart disease. So to get to the mental aspects, you, you can imagine that we're, we're facing a new realm, a new digital ether, digital world, where our mind is in pretty much half the time. The average American spends eight hours a day on the screen. So if you're sleeping for the other eight hours, that means half your waking life you're spending looking at a screen and absorbing all that information from your Facebook, Twitter, text messages, uh, cell phone, you name it. And that leads to distractibility, it leads to stress, especially when you don't have time to sit back and process that information in a healthy way. Once again, the sedentary lifestyle that this information overload caters to, well, we're basically driving to work every day, sitting in front of the screen for eight hours a day, maybe we get a one hour lunch break, driving home, and then sitting in front of another screen until we go to sleep. This is a sedentary lifestyle. This is a recipe for chronic disease. If you go home and you do this 20 or 30 years, I guarantee you, you will develop at least one major chronic disease. And unfortunately, this is a lot of way, this is the way a lot of Americans today are living their lives. And this is another simple graphic to kind of bring home the idea of ill evolution, where you can just see the, the intangible consequences of having a sedentary lifestyle. The effects to posture, the effects on vision, it's really an assault on the mind and the body to live life this way. Artificial light is another non-obvious category where I argue too much is not a good thing. What we're discovering is that art too much artificial light not only leads to more obvious problems like insomnia and sleep disorders, there's actually a new category of disease called circadian rhythm disorders that psychiatrists have just placed in the diagnostic manual within the last 10 years. Other mental health disorders and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and major types of cancer have been associated with an overexposure of artificial light. A lot of these studies have been done in night shift workers where they find that they have a 40% increased risk of diabetes, 50% increased risk of heart disease, twice the risk of breast cancer. And actually the World Health Organization has labeled night shift work to be a probable carcinogen in the same class as UV radiation. Why is this happening? What's the science behind this? Well, we evolved to synchronize our sleep wake patterns with the rise and fall of the sun. With artificial light, especially after it spread rapidly post-industrial revolution, we start to desynchronize from that simple pattern, and our metabolic processes, our hormonal processes, our physiological processes start to get confused when we start eating in the middle of the night when our body is telling us to shut down. Psychoactive substances. So we know that one glass of red wine a night is actually cardioprotective, thanks to resveratrol. But too much is obviously not a good thing. And we become technologically savvy enough to isolate active compounds and certain substances and plants, and make that readily available on a mass, mass uh, scale. That leads to all different types of addiction we've never seen in the past, substance abuse, and other mental health disorders. So that's kind of a bleak picture, but once again, we have to understand that the fact that we're facing this new set of diseases is actually a sign of progress, that we're not starving to death, that we're not suffering, bleeding to death, that we've figured out how to overcome those problems, and we're actually being exposed to, basically, you know, becoming victims of our own success in a way. So we have to manage that. And thankfully, the healthcare system is starting to recognize that. So if you saw the cover of Time Magazine from this month, it was, the cover article was titled Mindful Revolution. So mindfulness is actually getting a lot of adoption in healthcare settings. There's a lot of science behind the benefits of meditation and yoga, things that have been taught for thousands of years, but just now getting recognition, not just from a grassroots level. We're seeing the yoga studios pop up left and right, but there's a reason for that. There's science, there's MRI studies showing the impact on our health. And basically, mindfulness is a, is, is, a, is a kind of skill. It's basically the skill of focus and attention and trying to uh, focus on our priorities in the distractible world, the stressed out world. Chronobiology, I mentioned, so a lot of that science is new. It's just coming out of the basic science level and starting to hit the clinical knowledge spectrum. So we're starting to see government regulations kick in. We're starting to see healthcare personnel address this. We've seen a limitation of physician resident working hours, for example. We're seeing limitations on airline and pilot schedules, on trucker schedules. This is starting to be addressed because we know now that to, uh, artificial light, irregular sleeping patterns can lead to chronic disease. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So this is another good sign that we're moving in the right direction in terms of healthcare. It was just founded in 2004. They're having just their third annual uh, congress this year. It actually happens to be in San Diego. And they're calling for a new set of vital signs. 
So the traditional vital signs of heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, were very meaningful in an acute care setting, especially if you're in a hospital or an ICU setting. But the fact that my heart rate might be 82 right now and yours might be 76 really doesn't mean anything. It's not a major predictor. It's not really helpful in predicting our probability for morbidity and mortality. But things like how, much, how, much, how, how many hours do you exercise per day? Uh, how many hours of sleep are you averaging per day? Um, how many calories are you taking in per day? Basically, outlining real lifestyle parameters and quantifying those things are being viewed as a new, necessary means of monitoring our vital signs. They're much more prognostic of our potential for morbidity and mortality than the vital signs of the past. And so this frame shift is happening now. The startup company I'm involved with is called O-Waves. We're developing wearable devices and wireless health tools that are also cropping up just now as the healthcare setting has finally made the shift towards IT and electronic medical records. It's basically boosting a whole new realm of innovation where we can actually monitor and track the vital signs that I've been talking about, the lifestyle vital signs, like how much you're exercising, how well you're eating, how well you're sleeping. Starting to quantify that because it's hard to manage what you can't measure. But really, the best preventive medicine tool there is, is something you already have, it's your brain. And especially the prefrontal cortex, which we've highlighted here. Really, thriving in today's society takes, takes consciousness, it takes awareness, it takes planning, it takes decision making, and it takes self-control. And all this is on you in order to manage yourself in, an over, in a society that's pretty, basically full of excess. You have to figure out what your proper optimal level, of, level is. But what we'd like to do in line with the theme of this event, which is the power of one, the power of many, right now it might be an individual one-on-one -on -one struggle, with, whether it be with your employer, with your family, with, your, with your, the set routines and habits that you have, that you're surrounded by and you're trying to strive towards newer goals. Right now, the power of one is what carries you, toward, carries you towards a wellness lifestyle. But what we'd like to do is shift our environment so that it's actually the power of many that carries us and helps us thrive to live to 101 plus years old. And so we have to change our environment so that if we take the metaphor back of that frog in the boiling water, right? We don't want our kids to be in boiling water. We don't want them to be in water that's steadily boiling. We want them to be in, you know, in, in a, a nice pond, right? <laughs> Where they're just kind of happy and kind of, you know, floating around from lily pad to lily pad. Sorry, it's, I'm just using the metaphor here. But really what we want to do as a team, as a culture, as a society, is create an environment where our kids can thrive as almost a default pathway, right? It doesn't take that individual struggle to tell your employer why you have to take an hour or two of exercise per day, or justify why you turn your cell phone off after 6 p.m. so you can have some alone time with your family and have a deep night's sleep. So thanks to Kim Beswick, who actually did a lot of the artwork, and this talk I'd like to dedicate to my aunt, Dr. Ma Lilly, who passed away just recently. And if you're interested in the topic, feel free to follow our blog, always.com.